Good morning. Welcome to Park Cities. I'm sure everybody's uh, glad to be here. I hope you're glad to be here. Uh, we are in the middle of a series that's really important for our church. And it's important because uh, our, our leadership, both, both staff and lay leaders, have kind of gotten together and, and, and been asking the question, where are we going over the next 10 or 15 years? What's this place going to be like? What's this neighborhood going to be like in 10 or 15 years? And, and uh, it's quite remarkable to hear, hear some of the things that are going on, all those things we talked about. Uh, but we're in the middle of a series saying, uh, describing what is it that we're dreaming? What is it God's giving us? What are we imagining that's happening? And so last week we talked about Christ centering us. And that, that makes a lot of sense. We want to be a church uh, that is like the, the universal church, right? That, that Christ is the foundation. He's the cornerstone of faith. He's the cornerstone of, of everything that's about the church. And so Christ centering us is important uh, just for the core of who you are. Today, we're talking about scripture guiding us. As you heard Jeff talk about, uh, he's doing a wedding in one of the Carolinas. I thought it was north. Somebody corrected me. It was south. I don't trust them. So I'm just saying it's one of the Carolinas. And you get a little peek into my brain and how that works. And so he wants to, wanted to be here, but he had committed to this a while back, and so he's, he's doing that, and, and so you guys get me uh, this Sunday. But uh, it's really, really neat about how God is working uh, through the scriptures and through the dwell readings and, and just knowing that, that God is working in our lives through, through that. And so uh, we, these are a series of distinctives in our church, Christ centering us, scripture guiding us. We're going to go on and on through October 22nd. Uh, which we'll all be worshiping in the sanctuary and uh, spending time there together. And then we'll have uh, lunch out on the lawn and kind of all of this saying, this is where we're going. This is, this is what we're doing. And so uh, it's an incredibly important uh, time. I'm glad you're here if you're new or if you're a guest uh, and you kind of want to know, hey, what's this about? This is a good, good season to be here at the church. We also are memorizing a verse. Uh, I'm still working on it too, but we're going to read it together. If you'll join me in reading it. Uh, it says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's Ephesians 3.20 uh, to 21. Now that seems like a passage that's incredibly applicable. Like you can, you can memorize it, you can kind of hold on to it, you see the, the application and the importance. Uh, sometimes scripture is not quite so apparent as to its use. There are some passages in Judges that you're like, why did I need to know about this left-handed man who assassinated somebody? What, what God, has, that's not going to be my life verse. Sorry. What am I going to do with that? Uh, there's some other stories that are kind of wonky. There's one, I think Elijah or Elisha calls some bears to kill some kids. It's kind of crazy. Look it up. Um, and you're like, how am I going to apply this? And that happens. Sometimes you get something and you're like, how am I going to use this? When am I ever going to use this? When I was 16, uh, I got a Christmas present and it was a air pump. You plug it into the cigarette lighter of your car, excuse me, the power outlet in your car. We're Baptists, we don't smoke. Power outlet in your car and you can pump up your tires. And I remember at 16 thinking like, okay, like when am I ever going to use this? Like I'm 16, I want something that looks cool or goes fast or, or whatever. I don't. I don't need an air pump. I have dad. Dad can come and rescue me. Um, then uh, later on, I moved to Dallas, and I have used that air pump. It's still in the back of my car. I use it all the time. It's a lifesaver. But at the time, I didn't see the value. And sometimes scripture is like that. Sometimes scripture is this thing where you're like, I don't know, God, when I'm ever going to use that. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like you read, you open up the Bible, you're like, yeah, I want God to speak to me. And you get to like Leviticus, and you're like, oh. Let's go to a psalm. That speaks. Let's just skip over here. Today, I want us to see that Scripture guides us, that Scripture speaks to us, and it speaks in any place to anyone at any time. Any place, anyone, any time. We're in Acts chapter 7. This is Stephen's speech, which is beautiful. I asked the last, uh, some people have had to memorize Stephen's speech. I asked the last uh, uh, hour, if anybody's ever memorized it, and nobody had. Has anybody memorized it before? Okay, we're a godless church that needs to repent. Got it. Good. It's <laughs> moving on. Um, no, I've never memorized it either, but I think I had a buddy in school that memorized it, so that's, that's why I asked. Maybe that was just unique. So let's talk about Scripture speaking anywhere 
Scripture speaks anywhere. Now, I would love to read all of Stephen's speech. It's very lengthy. Uh, I would encourage you, especially if you're doing the dwell readings with us, you did read it already. But I would encourage you to go back and and read the whole thing in its entirety. But uh, one of the cool things about the speech is the way in which Stephen kind of places himself in the context of salvation history. It's really cool. And and if you don't know who Stephen is, Stephen kind of first appears on the scene in the previous chapter, in Acts chapter 6, because there's a division in the church. Surprise, there's conflict in the church. What happens is there's a group of, the, 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 the church is kind of ethnically divided between Greek Christians and more Jewish Christians. Both of them have Jewish backgrounds, but, but there's, there's some differences there ethnically. And, and the, the Greek widows are not getting the same uh, care that the Hebrew Christian widows are. And so what the apostles say is they're like, hey, we would love to take care of this. This is important. We don't have the bandwidth to do that. We're doing some other things. Let's appoint some men to be in charge of this. And so Stephen is one of the men that are appointed. And from there, he goes on to having a very brief but amazing ministry of doing signs and wonders and and miracles and all this stuff. And in the midst of this, some of the people that are from the same ethnic background he is, they're also kind of Hellenistic, Greek, uh, Jewish uh, men and women. They're, They're not Christians. They bring him before the Sanhedrin and they say, this man is blaspheming against the temple and the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, you guys need to do something about this. And so this is where we come upon Stephen's speech in Acts chapter seven. And like I said, I would love to cover the whole thing because he starts with Abraham, he ends with the crucifixion of Jesus. And one of the things that one of the commentators I read this week talked about that I had never noticed before is how geographically oriented the speeches, how it so, uh, picks up so many different locations. And you'll see it starting in verse two. And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Okay. So it, starting in Mesopotamia, then he moves him into Haran, and in verse 4, then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran, and after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. And then you skip down to verse 9, and you hear Joseph being spoken to, and the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him rule over Egypt and all of his household. You skip again to verse 29, and now we're talking about Moses. At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. And then he skips again to verse 38. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers, he received living oracles to give to us. So the the living oracles, that's the law. That's the 10 commandments that were given on Mount Sinai. So now you might be sitting there being like, Travis, why did you just take us on this whirlwind journey of ancient Near East geography? Like, what was the whole point of that? Well, I want you to see uh, what Stephen's doing because it's important because of who is speaking, okay? One, remember what Stephen is being accused of. He's being accused of speaking blasphemy against the temple. And the people that are accusing him of that believe that God's presence dwelt in the temple and that God was only capable of speaking out of the temple organization, which meant God only spoke in Jerusalem. And what Stephen is doing in a subtle, not so subtle way is being like, let's go through our shared history and talk about all the places that God spoke, not called Jerusalem, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Midian. Mount Sinai, on and on and on he goes. All places not called Jerusalem, all places that happened before the temple was built. Stephen is reminding these temple aficionados, these templophiles, that God can speak anywhere because he has. He has spoken anywhere. And now especially that Jesus Christ has come and the spirit of God has descended to live inside of his people, God is speaking anywhere. And this is so important for us today. 
Because we have this tendency to not understand that God's word can be read, studied, and appreciated anywhere. We like to think that one part of our church is more sacred or more holy than another place, right? So if you're in this service, obviously I would think you would prefer probably either the style here or the environment, whatever, this is your service, and that's okay. But sometimes we have this tendency to view other ways of worship, other other ideas as, no, 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 that's that's not how God speaks, that's not how God, God doesn't work like he works here. This is really where the spirit moves. One part of our city is not more holy and more more, uh, open to God's voice than other parts, right? Like there's South Dallas, where Chris is, Pastor Chris was talking about, God is clearly speaking and working there. There's Bachman Lake where God is clearly speaking and working there. But God is clearly speaking and working here as well, in this place. One part of the world, God doesn't speak more clearly. It's not more sacred than other places. God can speak anywhere. But we have this tendency to tie uh, God's voice to a place. And I think the reason why we do this is because we have heard God in that place before, And so we kind of become expectant that God would speak there. And one of the natural consequences of that is that we don't think God will speak in other places. One of the things that we do with the, with the residents, so I have the the privilege of of kind of directing the residency program here. And one of the things we do is we study uh, the spiritual disciplines. And one of the spiritual disciplines we talk about is the discipline of study. And so what I have them do is we all write what we do with our time with the Lord. How do we spend our time with the Lord? And we write it on the board. And then I find some like random number generator on the internet. And we, we swap personal time with the Lord. So whatever you do, I get yours. And for the next week, I'm going to spend time with God the way that you spend time with God. And I always get two things out of my residence. One is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is so hard. I don't like this. I don't want to wake up early to do this. Two, they always come back the next week and they're like, I would have never thought to have done that. And it shaped and changed me. And I might incorporate it into, into, into how I spend time with the Lord. It might come as a surprise to you, but we all have patterns and preferences, things that we like to do, things we find more rewarding than other things. And often it's associated with location. Often it is. These are places where we expect God to show up. There is nothing wrong. And I want to be very clear about that. There is nothing wrong with holding a place as sacred. You see it throughout the Old Testament. People honor certain locations as where God spoke and they make it uh, special, right? Uh, If somebody's been to the Holy Land, they'll tell you about how scripture hits a little bit differently because they've been to the Holy Land. In fact, they probably won't ever stop telling you about their visit to the Holy Land. And there's nothing wrong with that. What is wrong is to begin to think that God will not speak in other places and to even start looking down on other people because they attend a different kind of worship service or they, they, they interact with God in a way that's different than you. That is wrong. And we develop these habits without realizing it. We, we kind of cauterize our spiritual sensitivity and we kind of put God on a tr- as, as a train on a track rather than recognizing that God is more, we're more like a, a ship at sea and God is the one that kind of guides us with his currents. And the really sinister thing is you might not even realize you're doing it. So how would you know? How would you know if you've calcified your life like this? Well, one, uh, if, if you are so resistant to change in your time with the Lord. And we have the dwell readings. I hope you're reading with us. We're in Acts right now, as I said. And uh, you know, we'd like for people to start journaling. Journaling is a great way to interact with the Lord. And if there's some hesitancy on your part, some resistance, that might be a sign, might be a sign that maybe you're kind of expecting God to work in certain ways and to speak in certain places, right? Um, maybe you're kind of fixated on one, one way of worship. We talked about uh, different practices. Maybe one of the things that you can do uh, corporately is kind of say, you know what, one Sunday a month, I'm gonna try a different worship service. One Sunday a month, I'm gonna go to the sanctuary. And, and I may, you know, it may not be my favorite, that may not be my preference, but you know what, I'm gonna go because I just, wanna, I just wanna experience God in a different way or understand what it is about the way that they, you know, come to the, the Spanish language service. I've done that before. And guess what? One of the things you need, I don't speak Spanish, but it's amazing and it's really passionate and it's impressive how much Spanish I learn <laughs> while I'm there. I'm like, oh yeah, that's that theological word for that, neat. Try that. Another thing thing that you can do is if you're not a part of a connect group, 
you should definitely be in one. So often we, we, we tie God's presence to the worship service. Oh, God moved in the worship service. And then we go home. We go into our own thing. Not recognizing that, that God has, still has things to say on Sunday morning. Being a part of a connect group, we're going to call it a Sunday school class, whatever it is. I would encourage you to be a part of that. And you might say, well, Travis, I'm supposed to come in here and listen to you talk for 30 minutes. And then I have to hear somebody else talk for another 30 minutes. What's the point of that? Well, God sometimes repeats himself. And we very often learn through repetition. God may have something he very much wants you uh, to learn during that time. So don't shortchange him. Don't think that he only speaks in a certain place. And come on Wednesday night, be a part of the pastor study or Dr. Katie McCoy's study as well. Uh, great places to hear God speak in ways that maybe you're not used to attending, right? So God can speak anywhere, but he can also speak to anyone. He can speak to anyone. Now, Stephen's speech changes. And if you've ever have a, had, a, had a conflict resolution class, you know that when you go from we language to you language, that's like pouring gasoline on a fire, right? Well, Stephen apparently did not have a conflict resolution class because he goes from the we language, this is our shared history, to you language. This is what you have done. This is the way you always are. And look what he tells them in verse 51. He tells them, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not Keep it. Speaking of life verses, I don't know that anybody has that one as a life verse. Look what he calls them. It's very blunt. It's very direct. The whole tenor changes. And look how they respond in verse 54. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. The Greek there is, is cut to the heart. They were enraged is cut to the heart. Now, I know when, when God speaks to me and I feel convicted, I feel that cut to the heart. I feel, oh. Yeah, that's, that's me. It happened to me a couple times actually this week where God was like, Travis, that's you. Like you do that. And, and when, praise the Lord, I, the spirit leading in your life, hopefully you respond with confession and repentance. Hopefully you respond in such a way where you say, yes, Lord, like that is me. I admit it. I confess, I repent by your grace. Give me the strength to leave that behind. But that is not what our, what our Sanhedrin friends do. Our Sanhedrin friends get really, really angry. And that happens sometimes too. Sometimes you enter into a state of denial. And you're like, yeah, but I don't do it all the time. Or you're like, yeah, you know what, God, you're right. I do know people too that are like that. It's interesting that you bring it up. My sister could really use this. I'm going to text it, screenshot it right here. Boom. And we totally ignore it. And then sometimes we just get mad. I'm going to close the Bible. We're like, God, why are you coming after me about this? I'm a good person. There's a whole bunch of other people that need to hear this rather than me. I want you to look again at, let's look together, I suppose, at the kinds of people that God speaks to in Stephen's speech. You know, Abraham, when God spoke to him for the first time in Genesis 12, was likely a polytheist. He's likely an idolater. Yahweh was probably one of many gods that he worshiped, actually probably Elohim at the time. He didn't have his name yet. We didn't, he didn't give his name out yet. Moses, or sorry, Jacob. Jacob's a liar, a cheat, a thief. Joseph, Joseph's a great guy, but young Joseph is super annoying. He's like, I have all these dreams and look at everybody bowing to me. And all of his family's like, stop it. And he's like, look at my Technicolor dream code. It's so neat. He's a brat. He's a super brat. And God still speaks to him. God still speaks to him. Moses is a murderer. And not just a murderer. That's a sin, obviously. But Moses has other complications in his life. Not sins, not at all. But things that might make him feel like God's not going to speak to him. He comes from a multi-ethnic background. He was born Jewish, but he was raised Egyptian. I, I, I've talked to people, I kind of know people that come from kind of blended family backgrounds, and there's identity crisis. They're like, what, who do I, what group do I belong to? Who do I identify with? 
He has a speech impediment. He's like, I'm not good at talking. Don't make me do that. We become convinced that there are only certain kinds of people that God speaks to. And you're like, Travis, of course God speaks to you. You're a pastor. Of course God speaks to you. No, no, no. It's not like that. God wants to speak to anyone. But we have these things in our life. We have either rebellion in our life. We have sin that maybe is ongoing. And we think, oh, God doesn't want to speak to me. God wouldn't want to speak to me. Or you have in your life, you have a, um, uh, maybe a, a challenge or a disability of some kind. I, I was thinking about this this week, actually, about how often we talk about God wants to speak to you through, you through the word of God, through reading the Bible. And I can't imagine how hard it must be to have dyslexia and be told again and again and again to read your Bible. And to think, well, if God wanted to speak to me, why did he give me such a hard time reading his word? And I'd never thought about that before. And I get that. Like, I understand it. I don't, I, don't, I don't struggle with that. But it breaks my heart because, again, like how challenging that must be and what a, what a difficulty that must create in your relationship with the Lord. But this is where we have to have faith. God has said he wants to speak. And praise God, we live in an era now where, where you can listen to the word, you can, you can watch it. There's actually a, a, a YouTube recording of like the, Johnny Cash reads the entire Bible. I'm not kidding. It's the King James Version, but he reads the entire Bible. And so if you want to hear the, the word of God from the man in black, go for it. It's, it's good stuff. God wants to speak to all of us. And you may think, Travis, I get it. You're just saying it because you're trying to be nice. No, I'm really not. I know God wants to speak to all of us because look at what happens at the end of the chapter. Or, or sorry, here at the end. Who is he speaking to? At the end of Stephen's speech, who is God speaking to last? He's speaking to the Sanhedrin. Stephen has been sent there. Now, I know he's been arrested, but I believe in the sovereignty of God. And so whether he's being hauled there or he walks there, it doesn't matter. God is still sending him to tell the Sanhedrin to confess and to repent. And there's still an opportunity for him, them to have a relationship with God, which is amazing because you know what the Sanhedrin is most famous for? They're the ones that voted to kill Jesus. They're the ones who voted to put an innocent man to death. And not only an innocent man, but the innocent son of God. They have Jesus' blood on their hands. And you know what? God is still trying to speak to them. He still calls them to confess and to repent. So now tell me again why you think God won't speak to you. They did the worst thing imaginable, and God is still trying to reach them. God wants to speak to all kinds of people of all different backgrounds, of all different kinds of races, of all different sexual orientations. God wants to speak to everyone. The only group that has a hard time speaking to God are the hard-hearted ones. And hard-heartedness can look like a lot of things, but the one in our context that I think appears the most often is when we think we know what God is going to say. And this happens a lot, especially if you grew up in church, you know the Bible stories, and so you open up the Bible and you come to the prodigal son, or you're, you read Luke chapter 2 because it's Christmas time, and you're like, oh, I heard Linus already, I know what this is going to be, I know what God, God's going to say. That is a special kind of hard-heartedness where we think we know what God's opinion is. And so rather than humbly coming to God and saying, God, what do you have to think about this? What do you have to say about this? We instead say, I know how this ends. I know how this story goes. I know how this goes. I know what you're going to say, God. You know what we don't know? You don't know how that scripture is going to end in your heart. Because God may have been working all these years so that the story of the prodigal son, the story of the Christmas story, something like that hits you differently than it ever has before. God could be working all these years. He speaks to Moses after 80 years. Do you know all the stuff that happens in Moses' life? He speaks to Joseph in Egypt. All these things happen. And Joseph probably knew the story of, of, of God speaking to his father and his father's father and his father's father's father. He knows all this stuff, but it hits differently at a certain time. God wants to speak to you. And when we approach him and think, oh, I know what he's going to say about this. 
That's when we're hard-hearted, especially in our context and our culture. We have to stop letting our emotions and our culture and our politics drive our interpretation of Scripture and instead go to God with a humble heart and being like, God, what do you have to say about this? I'm listening. It'll change your life. If you go and you, you take this card out that we have in the, in the bulletin, and it says here on the, on the handout, how will you focus on daily scripture reading? Will you read with us is essentially the question. Are you going to read with us? And I hope you know that that's a loaded question. It's not we just want you to peruse the Bible with us. We want you to read with us. We want you to let scripture read you. We want you to, to, to approach it with questions and to allow God to speak to you because it will change your life. And I know it'll change your life because I see it all the time and I saw it specifically in a couple, Laura and David Couch, who were baptized last week and you're gonna hear their story uh, right here on the video. I'm David Couch. I'm Laura. We have two sons and we've been married a little over seven, seven years, years now. now. And we've been at the church for about two years. That's right. I met Laura, um, probably you know, a, a couple years after college, and we really hit it off on our first few dates. A topic came up of, what's your religion? What do you, what do you practice? And I assumed we're from the South. He went to TCU, he played football. He's a Christian. Everybody here is Christian, right? And he told me he's not a Christian, and that was heartbreaking. So I said, I don't practice religion. Um, I, don't, I don't believe in God. I consider myself atheist on worst days, probably agnostic at best, and was pretty, I think, pretty anchored to that position. And from that night forward, the prayer was, dear Lord, please open his heart. Light a little fire in his heart. And um, that's been the prayer. I think as our relationship went on though, I think Laura was always praying for me and always, you know, I think leaving breadcrumbs or or putting things out there, you know, she would send me devotionals sometimes, you know, um, and point me in that direction. And again, I, I'd be receptive, but I wouldn't say I was, I was buying it. I wanted her to pursue her faith. I'm okay with raising her family in that. And, you know, I'm okay with the status quo. About two years ago, we had something happen in my family that was brought me to my knees world rocking, world shattering, devastating, and it was the catalyst for our faith journey. It was so galvanizing how she was in her faith um, and how she turned to God and turned to scripture. And for me, I think my heart, I could feel my heart start to open or to be less hard. And we were coming here um, at the time and I, you know, wanted, to get there or have an idea of getting there, but I was still kind of going through the motions, I would say, you know, going to service. And it wasn't until I think me actively pursuing and God speaking to me more in that way, um, where I was able to, I guess, embrace it. Looking at Dwell, it's like, I need to go back. <laughs> and so I think it's been reading, you know, reading the gospel and getting acquainted with the gospel. I think it was, it's probably been less than a year. And I asked Lauren, I was like, what is the like, I actually don't even know what is the gospel. All of a sudden, one day I was like, I, I believe. And it was just such an, a, a crazy moment for me because I think if I you know, look back five years ago, I just never, I just, I just never saw myself. And being in the scripture every day is us actively choosing God and to pursue that relationship. It feels like the answer to a prayer I said eight years ago and have continued to say every day, and it's transformed us. <laughs> Today we're being baptized. It's, it's awesome, yeah, to make a public profession of our faith. I think it's it's a it's another it's end of one chapter. It feels like for us, and obviously the beginning of a, a much bigger one. Where I I wouldn't be here without God speaking to me and my wife. Um, and I'm just so grateful that I've had that in my life and, and the opportunity to be where I am today. God can speak to anyone, somebody even who considered themselves an atheist on a bad day. It's amazing. I love that story. I would love to sit here and talk more about them uh, on and on and on because um, they're amazing people and God does amazing things. 
Uh, but we have one more idea to cover, the idea that Scripture can speak at any time. So he speaks in any place. Scripture speaks uh, to anyone, but he, uh, it also speaks at any time. Look at verse 55. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit and falling to his knees. He cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Sanhedrin doesn't listen to Stephen, unfortunately. They become irate. They charge at him. And, and ironically enough, they prove him right. He accuses them of being like their fathers who murdered the prophets. And that's exactly what they do to him. And it's, there's no trial. It's more like a lynching. They just drag him out of the edge of the city and stone him. It's very clear that the Sanhedrin did not expect to hear from God that day. They didn't expect to hear from a man who was going to see Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God. They didn't expect to hear that. This wasn't the, the time that God was going to speak. But if you look back at Stephen's speech, you see how God really does speak at any time. Now, you can go through the centuries and, and talk about how Abraham lived at a certain point, and then centuries later, there was Moses, and centuries later, David, and centuries and centuries, and, and on and on and on. But think about the places where these conversations happened. God spoke to them at Sabbaths, at festivals. He spoke to them when they were just hanging out under a tree. I'm pretty sure Abraham received the promise of a son while he was just chilling up under some oaks. They were preparing a meal while they dined, while they sang, while they wrote music. He speaks at night. He spoke in the daytime. God can speak at any time, at any time, any time. And you ought to be aware of that. You need to know that God does not waste your time. If you are in the word regularly, if you're doing the dwell readings with us, if you're spending time with the word regularly, guess what? Any time can be a time for God to speak. We often look at events as like, like, like I said, certain, if, if certain places are sacred, we also think of certain times as sacred. I like to do my quiet time in the morning or I like to do mine in the evening. But what about the car ride? Is that not a time for you to talk about what God is doing in your life? Is that not a time for you to listen to Johnny Cash read the Bible? Is that not a time for you to talk to your kids and ask them what they think about God? Is that not a time? What about at a meal time? Do we just pull out our phone and peruse the internet? Or is that a time for God to speak? Have you ever had lunch with the Lord? Just sitting there with him. As you're laying down to sleep at night, what do you think about? Do you think about the things you're worried about for the next day? Or do you think about what God has said to you? We need to start expecting God to speak at any time. Because he can speak at any time. And you know what will speak to you at any time? Literally anything else. If you have kids, they will speak at any time. And you don't know what it's going to be, but they will talk. I read an article that was like most unbelievable things that are in modern TV, and it's how children will like come onto the set, make a comment, and then leave, and the parents will continue their dialogue. That's not real. I've never continued dialogue with my wife. It's constantly interrupted by kids, right? Advertisements will speak to you at any time. The news will speak to you at any time. Some of us have Fox News on like loop. It's just constantly on in our house. Anytime. And until you put God's voice above those voices, you will have a thousand masters competing for your attention. But when you put God over those voices, you then have one master who has no boundaries, but for your good and his glory, he doesn't have boundaries. And he will speak to you at any time. You'll wake up in the middle of the night recognizing the voice of God. Because here's the thing about time. You never know when your time is up. Stephen probably did not wake up that day thinking, I'm going to die. But I think he was ready. 
I think he was ready. I think you can tell by his speech. I think you can tell by what he says. And I think he knew his time was up because a lot of people think he doesn't even get to finish his speech. He rushes kind of from Moses all the way to Jesus. He probably saw the anger of the crowd. And he's like, I've got to get to the gospel because if I don't, they're going to kill me before I get a chance to tell them how they can be saved. And so he cuts his speech short. We're all going to have a meeting with Jesus at a certain place, at a certain time, face to face with him. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? How would you know if you're ready? Let me ask you this. Do you know his voice? Because if the first time you've spoken to Jesus in your life is on that day, you're not ready. Because what we've done in our lives is we've built this barrier between us and God. And Adam and Eve started it. We just continued the family business of putting up a barrier between us and God. And sometimes in really good moments, we realize that we need to tear that down. So we, we try to tear some things out and we rip our fingernails out trying to tear bricks out of this wall. But God, in his grace, recognized that we couldn't take it down. And so he sends his son who dies on a cross for us to obliterate that barrier, obliterate that wall so that we can have a relationship with him, so that he can speak to us, to anybody, at any time, anywhere. But some of us act like that wall is still up. They tore down the Berlin Wall in 1989. And I guarantee you there were people that lived in that city that acted like the wall was still up. They never went to the other part of town. They never went across the boundary. They acted like that wall was still up. And some of us live that way. Some of you live in a way that says the wall is still up. God doesn't want to speak to me. And that is such a lie. Anyone could be you. Anywhere could be right here. And anytime could be right now that God wants to speak to you, are you listening? Or are you just going to walk out of here and go to lunch and act like nothing happened? What a waste of time that is. God doesn't want to waste your time. He doesn't want you to waste your life. Are you going to listen? Because he wants to speak to you because he loves you. He loves you so much. Put your faith in him. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and for the truth that you speak. Thank you that Stephen, although they tried to shut him up, that he got the last word and that he still speaks today because you're speaking through him. God, may you give us the privilege and the honor to be your mouthpieces. And may you speak through us, Lord. May you speak to us. That's in your son's name we pray. Amen.